Today's video is sponsored by Anchor for deals on the latest USB-C chargers, including one that could charge a MacBook and a chance to win a ton of different prizes, including an iPhone 10. Check out the links below. The iPhone 10, it's not perfect, but it is really good. Yo guys, Jonathan here, and today I am diving deep into the iPhone 10, both the good and the bad, and if you picked one up, I would love to know what your experience has been so far. So with the iPhone 10, there are a couple key elements that make this phone what it is, the first of which being the display. It's a 5.8 inch OLED panel with a classically weird Apple resolution of 2436 by 1125 and weird numbers aside, it looks really good. I think any doubt or concern with the display not being bright enough has been put to rest. It's super bright, the colors are extremely accurate and honestly, the display is one of the most enticing features of the iPhone 10. Now for the million dollar question of is there any blue shift? And yeah, if you look for it and you tilt it off axis, you will definitely see a little bit of that. It is by no means Pixel 2 XL status, but there's no denying if you're a little tilt and shift crazy, you are gonna see a little bit of blue. Now the reason Apple is able to squeeze so much screen into the iPhone 10 is because of what is probably the biggest change to ever come to the iPhone, and that is the omission of the home button. It is completely gone. Honestly, I got used to this and adjusted to it way, way faster than I thought I would. And no joke, every time I pick up a phone that is not the iPhone 10, I find myself wanting to swipe up to go home. Now for the most part, this works incredible and I don't find myself missing the home button, but there are a couple dumb things. One is control center. That used to be a one-handed move where you swipe up and that's how you access control center, but now you gotta swipe down all the way in the top right and most of the time, to comfortably do that, you need to use two hands. Conversely, you can enable reachability, which is not enabled by default. So pro tip, head into settings, general, accessibility. Once you have it enabled, you can access reachability by doing this really, really precise swipe down at the bottom edge of the phone. It's definitely easy easier than having to reach all the way towards the top right of the phone and then swiping down, but it's still two steps and I don't think it's a foolproof solution. Now I know Snazzy Q is busting out the seams and has this well thought out elaborate solution to this, but I would also love to know what you guys think is a better alternative to this weird control center option we have now. From there, the other slightly dumb thing that's not really a huge deal is how you exit out of apps. Before, all you used to do is open up multitasking, swipe up, and that was it. Now, once you're in the multitasking window, you actually gotta hold the app, wait for that little minus icon, and then you can swipe out and exit out. Yeah, it's not the biggest deal in the world, and before anyone yells at me, I totally get it. Technically, you don't have to exit out of apps, but for me, it's just kind of one of those unnecessary two-step movements. Now, with the lack of home button, the way you enable Siri is by one, saying, hey, not gonna say that and trigger your phone, or two, holding the side button. Now, one slightly annoying thing is if you have Do Not Disturb enabled, unless you are in Control Center, there is no way to know that it's on. Whether you're in the lock screen or actually in the phone, there is no icon in the top right-hand corner, which makes it super easy to forget that it's on. Now, from there, that kind of leads into the next controversial thing with the iPhone 10, that is the notch. Initially, every mostly angry tech fans on Twitter seem to hate it. Demonetized. Honestly though, the notch really isn't a big deal. Like 95% of the time, I don't realize it's there. The only time I do notice it is when I'm watching widescreen video because the way that's formatted, that notch is creeping its way in there and there is nothing you can do about it. Now on the flip side of that, for most YouTube videos that are in 16 by nine, you are not seeing the notch whatsoever. Yes, you can zoom in, but for the most part, that's not the optimal viewing experience because you are chopping off heads. Over the weekend, both Kevin Kenson and Austin Evans dropped some incredible looking widescreen video and watching those back on the iPhone 10, it kind of got me thinking, is this the future of content? Especially with more and more of these phones headed in that direction. The video you're watching right now is also in widescreen. So if you're watching on an iPhone 10 or a Galaxy S8, I would love to know how it looks on your phone. Next is Face ID, that feature that anyone anti-Apple deep down really wanted to fail, but in actuality was really well done and well executed. Just like the iPhone 10, Face ID isn't perfect, but it's really good. For me, it has to have worked like 98% of the time. There really hasn't been too many times where it's failed. It absolutely works at night, in the dark, whether you're in a car, I've been in planes where it's worked flawlessly. On the opposing end of that spectrum, it's worked great outdoors, in sunlight, with glasses on, with a hat on. The only time I've ever really had trouble with it is in the middle of the night when I wake up, I got one eye closed and then it kind of trips up, but for the most part, it's worked really well and I haven't really missed Touch ID. I think where Face ID really shines is for password-based applications, especially when you're browsing online, you're already looking at the phone, so it kind of becomes this instant thing that you don't really think about. The other pro with Face ID is in the case where your hands are wet or it is crazy cold outside and you are forced to wear gloves. Yes, the same argument could be made with Face ID in those situations where it doesn't work, but overall as a whole, I think it's a step in the right direction. It hasn't slowed me down at all. Now, because of all that tech required for Face ID, that has also yielded 
and emojis. I guarantee you by now you've probably seen some ad emoji karaoke in your feed, but I want to give a shout out and some credit to Mr. Snazzy Q for the best one on the internet right now. I kind of wish I had a dollar for every time someone said, the iPhone X, the thousand dollar emoji machine. One, it's an emoji, and two, it's kind of fun, man. So are ad emojis the sole reason why you would buy an iPhone 10? Absolutely not. If you want to use them, they're there, but if you don't, no one's forcing you. God, I remember that. Now, as far as performance, that A11 Bionic chip inside the iPhone 10 is no joke. Everything from multitasking to gestures to gaming is buttery smooth. Now, with all that power, one area where the iPhone 10 and even 8 and A Plus, for that matter, excels at and are kind of in a league of its own is AR. It's still really early in terms of the development of apps and games, but there's some pretty incredible stuff out there. And if you own an iPhone 10 or 8 or 8 Plus and haven't checked out augmented reality yet, it is a lot of fun. I will say it's worth mentioning that this is the exact same chip also found in the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, so it's kind of a testament to their performance as well. But as far as smartphone performance goes, it is not even close right now. Three, two, one. But the iPhone 10 doesn't have as many cores as clearly. It is not about the cores because there is some insane performance coming out of the iPhone 10 as well as the 8 and 8 Plus. So now that we're fired up and before anyone asks, what about the iOS bugs? Why did I have the bowl? Yes, performance on the iPhone 10 is incredible, but there is no denying iOS has been a little weird, especially no one can forget that weird, stupid eye glitch where you typed an I and it auto-corrected into some weird characters and a question mark. It has been since updated and fixed, but it was out there for a long time. And honestly, that was one of the weirdest, dumbest, most annoying bugs I've ever dealt with on a smartphone. So to say the iPhone 10 has been an overall smooth experience isn't quite the case. From there, shifting to some positive, the camera in the iPhone 10 has been incredible. Again, this features dual lenses, a wide angle, and then a telephoto lens, but the big thing here is that telephoto lens now features optical image stabilization. Now, we first saw this dual lens with OIS on the Note 8. It's something the iPhone 8 Plus does not have, and it definitely makes a difference. The biggest thing I've noticed jumping from wide angle to telephoto is that you're getting a much more consistent image in terms of low light and low light performance. Portrait mode in terms of the rear facing camera is excellent. I think Apple does a really great job with this. As a whole, there really isn't much to complain as far as the camera goes on the iPhone 10. Images are crisp, they're sharp, they're vibrant, they're saturated. Now, as far as the front facing camera goes, I would say it is equally as impressive as the rear camera. My only real gripe with it are portrait selfies. Regular selfies look great. Lighting, color, skin tones. My only complaint is I wish it was just a little wider. It's something I've always liked on Samsung phones. But as far as those portrait selfies go, it just seems like it's not quite there yet. The actual image quality and skin tones and color all look great, but for whatever reason, it seems to have a real hard time with both hair and in my case ears where it just doesn't get those correctly. With the Pixel 2, the image is sometimes over sharpened, whereas with the iPhone, I much prefer the more natural look. So if we could somehow combine both these elements, that would be amazing. Now, while I think the Pixel 2 might have the slight edge on the iPhone 10 as far as photos go, there is no comparison in terms of video. The color, the ability to go up to 4K 60 frames per second, the image stabilization on the iPhone 10 is second to none. You have slow motion at 1080p up to 240 frames per second, which is ridiculous. So if you use your phone to capture and create video, the iPhone 10 is kind of in a league of its own as far as that goes. From there, notable mentions, battery life on the iPhone 10 has been surprisingly good. It's not as good as something like the iPhone 8 Plus or 7 Plus for that matter, but it is definitely better than both the iPhone 7 and 8. For me, I've been averaging about six to eight hours of usage, so getting through the day is not a problem whatsoever. The stereo speakers in the iPhone 10, yeah, they're not gonna blow your mind, but I do enjoy having that feature, and it does make a difference over phones that don't have stereo speakers. As a whole, I think the iPhone 10 is the best and most exciting thing Apple's put out in a very long time. I'm excited to see where this goes in the future, not only with Apple specifically, but with the smartphone game as a whole. What I'm saying is that it's a great time to be alive in terms of smartphone technology and technology in general right now. The iPhone 10 is definitely a part of that. I've enjoyed it. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did and you are feeling like being awesome, make sure to go Batman on that like button. This is Jonathan and I will catch you guys later.